Hey, everybody. Um, as you know, we love uh, sort of giving folks access to differentiated investment ideas across the globe. Uh, today, we have um, uh, one of our uh, original members on Sum Zero who's uh, posted dozens of ideas on Sum Zero, mostly in Central Europe. Uh, his name is Jan Martinek. Um, and today, he's actually here to talk to us about a US stock that he wrote about on Sum Zero back in 2020 um, that has since. I think uh, more than doubled since his original post. Um, but Jan, super excited to talk about it because there's a lot of upside left. Um, you know, this is a small cap name uh, in the industrial sector. The company name is called Energy Recovery, ticker E-R-I-I. Uh, Jan, welcome to, to Sum Zero. It's great to, uh, to, uh, to finally chat. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing more about ERII, but before we get to that, can you just tell us a little bit about your background in finance um, and, and how you kind of transitioned to, uh, to managing money uh, and just a little bit about your strategy as well? Yeah, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, I must say first that you guys have created amazing business and SumZero is a great platform and uh, it's just great privilege to be a member and, and also to be an alter. I, I start, I'm a former investment banker. I spent 17 years in London uh, at No More International. And we were doing first flow business. And then later on, we turned something which at that time we called merchant banking. In today's uh, language, it would be called private equity. So basically we took the bank's capital and we fund companies and we invest, we merge them, we divest it, we restructured, we increased profits by 500% over two years and we sold. I think the most my best transaction from that period is the Pilsner Urquell, where we bought five Czech breweries in Greek Pilsner Urquell, which is the original Pilsner. All the, all the beers all over the world are called after the brand. We merged it and we restructured and sold it to South African breweries. And that was, uh, that was our business. Then back in 2011, our team, uh, myself and two other members of the team, we left the bank and we set up our, our own family office. So basically now we uh, manage, we are three wealthy families. We manage our own capital. We don't take any external money. It's our, it's our capital. And we have been acting globally. Uh, we are, our mission is to find companies which have a unique position first by their product and secondly by the market. They get dominating position in their segment. They, by doing that, they, uh, they achieve extraordinary uh, profitability. And then when investors learn about them, they, uh, that is, that's reflected in, uh, in uh, the valuation. I think uh, Energy Recovery, which is the, the, the company uh, I've wrote about two years ago, is perfect example of it. And it is also one of our, our largest position. Uh, what, what, just before we start, uh, what's, what is the level of concentration you have in your book in ERI? I, uh, it is, as I mentioned, we are three, uh, three uh, families and each we are under one office, but we run three separate accounts. Got it. And so uh, in my portfolio, it would be above 10%. Over 10%, wow. Yes. Uh, why is energy recovery interesting or unique? And I, you know, there, there are many ESG companies and uh, they are, they, all, all ESG companies, they have a great vision. They have, some of them, they have a great product. Uh, much less of them, they have revenues and uh, very few of them make profits. And many of them will not have any future. Energy recovery is a core ESG play which has made it. They, 
it is hundred million dollars re <clears throat> annual revenues growing at twenty percent, uh, at seventy percent margin, no debt, uh, hundred million in cash, one point two billion dollar uh, market cap, and uh, what they have managed is they develop a product called pressure exchanger, and. In that, with that product, they managed to dominate uh, one industry, which is desalination, and revolutionize it. And then they started to implement that into other other areas and other other businesses. So They're let's let's just I, you know I think I think that's great. Um, let's talk about the product. So it's a it's a pressure exchanger and. It's used in desalinization plants, and it sounds from what you're telling me, they've monopolized that market. Uh, I think you mentioned in, in your report that um, every single desalination plant has this ERII uh, pressure exchanger um, in, in, in the plant itself. Um, why is that product necessary uh, for you know, this end market and, and why have they been able to develop this, this dominant market position? They originally, desalination was a thermal business. Thermal desalination was the, the way to do the, the desalination. The reverse osmosis was known, but it was too expensive because you had to create, you have to create a pressure and um, that if you don't, if you, and the pressure was lost and therefore it was more expensive than thermal. Then energy recovery came and what basically the product does is it enables to recycle uh, pressure that would be otherwise uh, lost into reusable pressure energy. Mm -hmm. Basically, I think, uh, I, basically it is uh, um, two, close and cycles, liquid cycles, where in one hand you have the pressure which you are you don't need and in other cycle you need the pressure. So through the rotor, it is converts the pressure from one close end cycle into another liquid uh, close end cycle without any mixing of the of the of the liquids. And I think it's it, it, for anybody who is interested, there is about one point one and a half minute video with uh, illustration on energy re recovery website, which very elegantly describes it, how it's, it's very simple. Pro on one hand side is very simple product. On the other hand it is a complicated product because the PX exchange must be very durable. You need to have uh, durability and not everybody can, can do it. So, what it sounds like it has to be machined to very high tolerances in order Absolutely. to work. Yeah. Plus it is done through the mo second most durable uh, material on earth, but I'll, I'll get to it uh, later. So what happened is that uh, pressure exchanger enabled revolution of desalination. Basically, it, it enabled the, the world to, to start to do uh, reverse osmosis desalination. And now all the plants have are, which are now being built are based on reverse osmosis. And all the major plants have energy recovery units in there. The energy recovery has not lost a major contract for seven years. The, their market share in, in large desalination plants is, is 100%. So it's uh, they they have they managed to, to to first create the industry by revolutionizing it and then completely conquer it and the result is that the revenues are growing twenty percent and the result is that their gross margin is seventy percent. So and just really quickly, how many desalination plants are there in the United States? I mean, like, what is the, the total addressable market for this product vertical? In, in at the moment, alone. At, yeah, at, at the moment, uh, the U.S. is has not been a great market for energy recovery. Most of the sales are in Far East and Asia. 
but this this is this is changing with the global uh, warming uh, with california you know droughts this will the, the 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 technology is coming everywhere you know at the moment uh there's two billion people around the world that have permanent water scarcity and the uh, united nations estimate that the water consumption will grow by 30 percent um, uh, by uh, 2050 and this is significant so it will be at the moment it is far east and asia product but it will become a more uh, more and more global product because the water scarcity issues is will be increasing and very recently they're starting to be starting to be uh, uh, discussions about building desalination plants in California. So it will happen. This is, uh, some people say, oh, you know, they have been growing 20%. Can they sustain it? This is just the beginning. And it's uh, the, the water scarcity is not going to go away. And the, the, the growth is, uh, the potential is great due to what we have done. It seems like a, um, a high growth, almost, um, you know, almost like a high growth technology business disguised as a, uh, you know, an industrial, an old world industrial company in a sense. Like what's, what are the origins of this company? Um, who are the original investors? How did they fund this business in the beginning? Uh, I am not best guy to talk about the, 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 the there was basically an inventor who, who came up with the technologies yeah. and it was in the 50s it took years to, to develop then energy recovery took over and they have started to, to produce it about 25 years ago and over the years they have there is about 25,000 pressure exchangers uh, running around the world and the company estimates that these 25,000 pressure exchangers just in 2020 saved $2.6 billion. So the, 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 the saving is, is amazing. Yeah. And it, it, sounds like, it sounds like, uh, like a business that's grown very organically, like not one that's you know, gone through the, the sort of booms and busts that you typically see with you know, traditional tech companies where they raise a lot of money, burn a lot of cash, raise more money, burn more cash. I mean, this sounds like a business that's just been profitable from a fairly early stage um, and, and has been able to kind of methodically compound its its business. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. And uh, the beauty of it is that they have learned how to do it. They have learned how to conquer one industry, one industry without any acquisitions. Without, of course, you know they made some mistakes, but they have organically managed to conquer one industry, and now they they are about to do it into other in in uh, other new industries. And I think the change came about three years ago when the new management came, Mr. Bob Mao. And what he did is he said, uh, you know, until now we were a water company. And the previous management, they deserved the credit for building desalination, but then they started to divert and they, they wanted to go into pumps and other low margin businesses. And Bob said, no, we are not a water company because you know, it makes no sense for us to compete in low margin pumps when we have a unique technology. We are pressure exchanges technology and our mission should be, and from that moment will, will be, uh, to find new areas where we can use this unique technology. And that's, that's uh, what happened since uh, Bob came they brought within the last year and a half, they brought two new uh, areas where the pressure exchanges uh, could be used and they managed to record sales on, of both areas. And both these areas have potential to be much bigger than their current desalination business. And, and so what are the, um, I know they have some sort of oil and gas uh, 
end user or end market as well. Where, what are the other spaces they're getting into, and how are they? How is the pressure of your product used in those industries? I think uh, let's start with wastewater. Wastewater was introduced about two years or a year and a half ago. And uh, it is again, very similar to desalination. It's again, use of reverse osmosis in, in uh, wastewater. They have managed to uh, already record sales, uh, in, mainly in India and China. They, they are selling the technology to specific wastewater treatment plants like battery production treatment to general wastewater treatments. And, and why does a wastewater treatment plant need a pressure exchanger or how does it benefit from one? It's again, the same, uh, it is just a reverse osmosis, uh, uh, reverse osmosis technology of, of cleaning water. When you, and again, until this, it was very expensive to do it this way. And therefore the, uh, the, the, the true voice water treatment plants, they, they were using to some form of thermal. And this is again, the pressure is able to replace thermal. And again, as, uh, I would encourage the, the listeners to go to, uh, to Energy Recovery website because they, they have this byproduct and then they have very simple videos which introduces each technology and describes how, uh, how this will be used. And again, what's the potential? It's, uh, you know, if you look uh, China, China, you know, every, there, every river, they claim they have one yellow river, but I've been there <laughs> two years ago and, you know, all, all rivers are yellow. And it's, you know, it's nothing bad about it. It's nothing offensive. I live in Central Europe and we had that 20 years ago. Every, every river was polluted, heavily polluted. And in Czech Republic, it took decades to clean it all. They said, we want to do it. And in one decade, uh, the wastewater, a lot of money went into wastewater. And that was a great progress. And it took very short period. And I think China is at that crossroads too. And so is India. I think these people, these countries, they are, they are huge markets and they will build thousands of wastewater treatment plants. And of course, you know, not everywhere will see energy recovery. But again, you know, it's, uh, they need very little part of that thousands to, to double their current revenue. And uh, so the company believes that uh, the wastewater will quickly be bigger than desalination. And the only question is whether it took 10, ten years to desalination to really uh, jump to 100 million. I think this will be faster. So the only question is whether it will take three years to have to reach 100 million or five years, but they, it will be bigger than, than, than desalination. That's incredible. What's the next market after desalination? I think the, the biggest change- And, and wastewater treatment. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think the biggest game changer for the company is refrigeration and air condition. I think this is what will make this company from 1 billion market cap to 10 billion market cap. And th the reason is global warming regulation fight against global warming. Uh, 120 countries signed a Kigali protocol to Kigali amendment to Montreal protocol in which they committed that uh, they will uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gases by 80% by 2047. It is already happening. And for example, in the US, uh, Biden administration uh, enacted regulation about three weeks ago, which, which states that they will achieve that 11 years faster by 2036. And what will, where, where will, where will the, what will this affect? It will affect air conditioning refrigeration because that's uh, where most of the greenhouse gases are used. And uh, what will happen is that these, uh, the greenhouse gases will be reduced by CO2. Again, 
will be replaced by CO2. The refrigeration and, uh, and uh, air conditioning will be run on CO2. Again, this is nothing new. Until when you say CO2, you mean as opposed to HFCs? Yes. Hydrofluorocarbons? Yes. Got it. And, and, and do the pressure exchangers facilitate that transition? Absolutely. What, what's happening is that this is nothing new. Until about 1950s, all, all air conditioning, refrigeration were run on CO2. And then people switch to HFCs because CO2 needs to run on about four times higher pressures. It means the system, if you have a higher pressure, it operating costs are higher and the system costs more because you need to have a bigger pressure. So, you know, CO, uh, HFC uh, system run on about 300 PSI, uh, CO2 runs about 1300 PSI. So when you, have higher pressure, you have higher energy costs. And uh, these costs are significant. For example, you know, for large supermarket, uh, air conditioning costs represent 50% of their of the of the energy cost. So it is material cost item. So once they convert to CO2, the cost will go up. Every pressure exchanger can say 40 to 60%. And again, it, what's beautiful is uh, the, this, uh, it is very simple application because uh, desalination runs on 1000 PSI. So this is similar pressure. So they have 25,000, they've sold 25,000 units. And so they have the experience at these pressures. They have run hundreds of tests and uh, they have, uh, I was told they didn't have a single failure. The system is very simple. Of course, you know, the savings will differ so in Siberia, where it's cold, you would have a small savings. In uh, California, where it's hot, you will have close to 60% savings. So, and the cost of the, 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 the payback period of these devices is under one year. So it is no brainer that the adoption should be very, very fast. And what's beautiful is that you don't need to, uh, the, the, the implementation does not mean major modification. You just plug in energy recovery device into the existing system and uh, they have retrofit kit uh, they developed and uh, it is just, you know, few days job. So are are you saying that you can take a, an energy recovery pressure exchanger and just retrofit it into a traditional air conditioning compressor? Uh, uh, not yeah, compressor. Yeah. Into the, yeah no, is it, is well, it in the air handler or is it in the the outdoor unit? No, you have to uh, you have to do it into CO two unit. Of course, you know you can do it into. So first, I think what will happen is that units will be converted into CO two, and then uh, as a part of the conversion, uh, they will implement the CO two device. But of course, you know, there is a, in Europe, this is already happening. So in Europe, there is about 100,000 large scale air conditioning refrigeration systems. Out of that 100,000, 35,000 is already converted to CO2. And just in the last two years, they converted 12,000. So it is happening and it is happening fa fast. So uh, energy recovery retrofit kit could be implemented into these 35,000 units quite quickly and start saving. And then of course, in the US you have 100,000 and uh, the, the number of seal to retrofit is, is minor. This is, but it is happening now. And actually by coincidence, as we speak today on Tuesday, 2nd November, today uh, Energy Recovery announced that they, are, they have signed a first contract with a US, uh, with California based uh, uh, supermarket chain, which has 50, 50 uh, outlets uh, on delivery of their device. And, you know, given that they introduced the device, they announced the device only two quarters ago, the implementation is quick. And these people, they have 50, 50 units and once this is proven in commercial area, in commercial process. The implementation could be could be very fast, and and in the world, as I said, you know, in Europe you have hundred thousand units, 
in the US, you have 100,000 units. Globally, you have about 500,000 units. So if you assume that one pressure exchanger goes for about $40,000, then this is a $20 billion target market. And of course, you know, you would say, oh, you know, they can't get 100%. Um, I would, you know, I think they can't, they will probably not get 100%, although they managed to get 100% in desalination. So they will have a material stake. But even if they get just 20% over the you know, next five years, then 20% 20, 20 of 20 billion is 4 billion. So that's $800 million annual revenues. And that's you know eight times uh, current levels. So it is. So let's talk about uh, yeah. before we get to the valuation. Let's talk about um, Vortec. Do you want to just give us a little bit of background there? Absolutely. Uh, Vortec is a product the company has been developing for for several years, and the difficulty with Vortec is that it. Uh, it uh, runs on much higher pressures and much aggressive environment than any of the applications. So reverse osmosis runs on 1000 PSI. Vortec, which is a uh, equipment for fracking, it runs on between 10 to 15,000 PSI. So once the company managed to develop this product, everything else at smaller pressures is just so much easier for them because they have managed to, to, to achieve Vortec uh, uh, development. Uh, the, the product was developed originally with Schlumberger and when Schlumberger sold their fracking service uh, to, uh, to Liberty Oil Services, the main partner is now Liberty Oil Services. I, would recommend anybody interested in energy recovery to watch a four minute video by Liberty Services uh, CEO on Vortec. So you just go on YouTube, say energy recovery, Liberty, uh, Liberty or services, and you get this video. And it's, you know, it's unusual that uh, CEO of multi-billion dollar company would go online and do a video on their supplier. And the reason is that Again, this will be a game changer product for, for fracking because it has three effects. First, it can save 40% of the energy, operating energy. Secondly, which is even more important, it saves the, the pumps from, from very aggressive uh, materials. And therefore it reduces the downtime of the whole system. So. This is, uh, it saves operating costs uh, by reducing downtime, reducing pump destruction, and also reducing energy. So this will be, this could reduce the fracking costs materially and just, it will be another fracking revolution uh, when this is done. Where are we now? I think Vortec, uh, they have done several live tests over the last uh, year and uh, the technology works. The only issue is reliability, not reliability, durability. The, 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 the pressure exchanger is made from, the cartridge is made from the second hardest material called tungsten carbide. And even that is, uh, is, is not enough. So they are now working, uh, they are putting a coating on it, diamond coating which should uh, reduce the, uh, the, the, the erosion and increase the durability. So the durability issue is, is about how much money worth uh, energy recovery makes from it. Because the more durable it is, the higher price they can charge and uh, the more money they make. So they can sell it now, but the margins would be lower because, uh, because they, durability is not their way where they want it. But I think they are they are getting there, and they have a call uh, next week, uh, the search quarter call. And I would not be surprised if they would announce that they are they are they are already there. On the Q2 call, they announced that they are ready to commercialize the Vortec. So they make the decision that they are close enough to start commercialization. 
I think on this call, quite likely they could tell us that they the, the, the diamond coating uh, diamond coating uh, make the durability sufficient for them to start production, and that could be again big game changer. Got it. Jan, before we uh, run out of time, um, let's talk about valuation. Can you sort of sum up, uh, you know, how you value this company across the different verticals that they have? Uh, as I mentioned, I am a former investment banker. And in my experience, uh, back of the envelope valuation are more, uh, or are at least equally accurate as detailed DCF models because the, 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 the back of the envelope, that's how industrial people usually, usually value businesses. So if you look at energy recovery, they are now 1.2 billion dollar business and they have 100 million dollar revenue. So at the moment they sell at 12 times uh, revenue. Yeah. And now let's just say, let's just see where how the revenues could develop, which should drive the valuation because uh, the, the profitability is increasing, you know, because the, 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 the costs, the, the operating, the, the, the overhead costs, they are fixed. So the higher, uh, they have a 70% margin on all the products at the moment. So the higher margins you create, the higher the profitability, the higher net margin is. So as I, as I was saying, if you, at the moment, if you just take refrigeration, then um, there is 500,000 units around the world and they will need to be all converted at some point. By latest by 2046 and in developed countries uh, by 2036. If you assume that one unit goes for $40,000, that's $20 billion. If you assume that energy recovery can uh, energy recovery can capture just 20% of that. That's $4 billion. If you assume that's over five years, so let's say in five years, revenue could be 800 million. That's eight times, eight times current revenue. And that's just for one product. You, you know, you can go, I think it's would, I would be surprised if, uh, or if uh, wastewater would not be 100 million revenue product in by, within five years. I would not. I would be surprised uh, that uh, water, which is growing at twenty percent, would not be two hundred million dollars revenue. So, it's very. I, I. It's very likely, in my view, that this will be one billion dollar revenue in five years. So, if you put it there, uh, and in five years the gross opportunity will be equal to today's, because first uh, the markets which they are in, they will be continue growing. And Bob Mao came within two years with two new applications. There will be new applications. They will, they are talking about uh, uh, an application for chemical industry. There will be new opportunities. So it will be, if you assume that it's a five, it's $1 billion revenue company, then you, you just have to think what, what the multiple you should put it. So if you would put their, uh, put their current multiple of 12, then you are a $12 billion company in five years. You can discount it uh, to, to, to current value. I believe my base case is that in five years, this will be 10 times the company. So since I wrote the story last year, the company has doubled. I believe it, we are just in early innings and this, is, uh, this uh, will be a very interesting story. It sounds like a 10x is your base case. That's my years. base case. What's your bull case? It's a blue sky. It could be $400 company. It's, you know, it, it depends if they can come, if they come up with other application, it could easily be $400 company. Mm -hmm. Because as the growth, uh, as the growth accelerates, the multiple accelerates. You know, right. High growing companies have uh, deserve higher multiples, so it could easily be four hundred dollars company. And, and what's what would you say are the biggest risks to their to this thesis? And and you know where is the competition coming from here? I at the moment they have no competition. 
and uh, there is a company uh, there is one comp uh, competitor in uh, in uh, refrigeration air condition called Dan and I've spoken about this to the company and they have tested their product. And they're saying that the, 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 their test did not uh, show the results which Danfoss uh, is arguing in their marketing communication. So they don't view them as real competitors. And, uh, but the, competitors, the competition will come. Uh, but at the moment, they, are, they have the competitive advantage because they have been doing this for, for 25 years. So it will take time uh, for, for anybody to, 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 to catch up and to, to because, you know, the, it is not expensive device. So uh, if you are supermarket chain, would you want to save, you know, a few tens of thousand dollars to, to go for some, you know, with lower track record? especially if the payback is under one year. It's just you, the premium for, for quality and reliability is small. So that's, that's the, the te their technology track record is the good barrier of entry. Yeah, we all love, uh, especially the value investing world, um, you know, companies that have, uh, you know, not only a track record of organic growth, but, but sort of this, uh, just all of the various call options that it seems like this this company has in terms of the different verticals they can, you know, they can they can dive into and already seem to be uh, very invested in. Um, is there anything you can, you know, I think maybe we can end on this, but uh, anything you see in terms of um, the management team that that you've been impressed by or, or that you think, like, do you believe they're the right team to kind of steward this company into the next five years? I've been very impressed by the change which Bob Mao brought three years ago. The company just changed the direction. And th since then, they seem to be doing everything right. And uh, I- Is he an engineer by background or more of a, uh, an operator or what's his, just curious what his training's in. I think he, he uh, was CEO of, uh, of, uh, of uh, large companies. And I think he has done one big transaction already before where he took company and uh, then and sold it to, to, to multi-mission of, uh, to multinational for you know, multi-billion dollar uh, price tag. So he has done it before. He has the CEO experience. He has been in energy recovery on the board for uh, several years before becoming CEO. But, you know, I, uh, it's not only Bob. I think it's uh, the whole team, whoever I talk to, I'm the, 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 uh, Josh Ballard, the finance guy, he, again, he is leading the company the right, uh, right way. I think it's whoever I talk to, the technical guys, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. So I don't know what they could have done better over the last three years. Do you get a sense from the CEO whether he wants to grow the business as an independent public company or or is he grooming it for a potential sale to one of the large industrial conglomerates like a, an Eaton or, you know, a Cooper Industries or something like that? Uh, I believe he understands that there is a lot of value on the table. And uh, they, uh, they, are, they have shares, they have share options. And I think it would be crazy for them to, to sell at this stage because if they sell in three years time, they will be multiple times richer than they would be now. So I think they are on the same board with all of us uh, shareholders. And I think they, uh, it would be uh, surprising if they would, they see the opportunities. When you talk to them, you see the excitement in their eyes. And, I think it would be surprising if they would sell at these levels or even double. It's just a lot of would be left on the Too table. Early. Too early. Too early. Love it. Jan, this is great. Um, I'm definitely going to be tracking this. I, these are exactly like the sort of stories I like to hear. Um, but thanks again for um, giving us all the color and the insights. Looking forward to uh, 
you know, maybe following up, um, you know, the coming year and, and doing a look back on, on energy recovery. And, um, you know, again, thanks again for taking the time to chat with us. Absolutely. Pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thanks, Jan.